This week, Jackson enlists the help of a former test cricketer to talk about the official game of this year's Cricket World Cup. Johnny Robot steps into the cinematic indie world of Life is Strange, and we take a closer look at the jumping sumo and the rolling spider. They're the mini drones from Parrot. This is Player Attack. Hi, I'm Jessica Citizen, and this week we're going to mix things up a bit by starting with some gaming movie news. First up, we finally know a little bit more about what's planned for that Assassin's Creed movie starring Michael Fassbender. The good news is, it is still definitely happening. The less good is that we will have to wait until December 2016 to check it out. With a storyline that sort of fits in with the renaissance setting of Assassin's Creed 2, Fassbender plays a new assassin, Aguilar de Aguero Robo, as well as a current day death row inmate, Michael Lynch. He'll be joined by Inception actress Marion Cotillard, who is playing a new character, Lara, also set in the present day. Arriving on screens far sooner than Assassin's Creed is the new film version of Hitman, Hitman Agent 47. If you are hoping for a super stealthy take on the franchise, you should probably keep looking. This one is set to be an action blockbuster full of guns, explosions and even Matrix style gymnastic tricks. Starring Rupert Friend, Agent 47 is a reboot, remake, spiritual successor to the 2007 movie Hitman. It doesn't really seem to have much to do with the original film, or the games for that matter, other than featuring a dude with a red tie and a shaved head. Personally, I think it looks great. The next live action adaptation is just a rumour at this stage and it has come right out of left field. Apparently Netflix is working on bringing The Legend of Zelda to television in a project described as Game of Thrones for a family audience. It is very, very early days on this one to the point where Nintendo has refused to comment on the story which first appeared in the Wall Street Journal, but if it comes to fruition it could be an interesting experience. At least we're hoping that this one's got a bit more merit than the other major Nintendo rumour that did the rounds this week, that Ubisoft's Rayman would be joining the Super Smash Bros lineup on Wii U. A very well produced video popped up claiming to be leaked footage, but after just a few days it was revealed to be the handiwork of game developer and animator Omni Jakala. Rather than letting himself be found out, Omni posted a video online posting exactly how he set up the detailed hoax and apologising to the many fans who were just a little bit excited over the news. As if that wasn't enough, this week saw a bunch of less than great news hit the games industry. First up, Bioware's much hyped action RPG Shadow Realms has been scrapped just six months after the initial announcement and surrounding fanfare. It seems the studio has decided that it was spreading itself a little too thin, continuing to support Dragon Age Inquisition while working on the next game in the Mass Effect series, as well as Star Wars and a cryptic reference to other new IP. At the same time that we were disappointed by the Shadow Realms news, we were buoyed by new info from the Star Wars camp, 64 player battles, a comprehensive single player campaign and a pretty serious focus on the original cinematic trilogy. But back to the bad news. Evolve is officially on shelves now, and while we are unashamedly fond of the 4v1 Monster Hunter from Turtle Rock, we're not quite sure what to make of 2K's approach to DLC. Traditionally, buying a season pass will give you access to all of the game's downloadable content, but not for Evolve. There is a whole bunch of additional stuff available for the game which will set you back more than a hundred bucks if you want to buy it all. Sure, it is cosmetic stuff, it's character skins and that sort of thing, but it does seem to go against the idea of an all-exclusive season pass. Also seeming to go against the idea of video games as we once knew them, Apple has rolled out a new feature for the App Store, a premium game section titled Pay Once and Play, that is, games without any in-app purchases or any other DLC. Back in the day, we just called those ones games. Meanwhile, it seems that Valve is restricting what you can talk about in Steam's online chat service. Any reference to a particular torrent site is being stripped from conversation while other similar sites are flagged as potentially malicious. Valve has not commented on the topic, explaining why that particular website is being targeted or outlining whether or not other sites are in the firing line, but for now, if you do wish to discuss such matters, maybe take your conversations away from Steam. And finally this week, a double whammy of good news direct from Blizzard. While it's not quite the remake we were hoping for, old favourites The Lost Vikings have finally appeared in a new game, with Olaf, Balog and Eric now playable in the closed beta version of Heroes of the Storm. 
We first heard about the trio's inclusion back at BlizzCon last year, but it's taken a few months to get everything organised. Now you will be able to choose the Vikings as a single unit, then decide which one is in control. Each one has their own unique skill set and can move, attack and be killed separately, or you can move them as a group to break chests more easily. So, one day I wake up to find that me and my friends are lost. Again. No one said it was your fault, Olaf, but if there's one thing we're good at, it's... Getting lost? No, Baylog, we're good at... <laughs> uh, now what? Uh, Listen, I'm trying to say that if we stick together, there's no obstacle... Oh, no! Back up! Oh, no! If you're not in the closed beta for Heroes of the Storm, or if MOBAs aren't really your thing, there is of course another option. Log into your Battle.net account and look in the Classic Games section. You will find an original copy of The Lost Vikings is sitting there, just waiting for you. And in other news, late last year, the studio released Argy, an in-game pet goat for World of Warcraft. Like many of Blizzard's vanity pets, it was sold for real-world money, but unlike many of them, all proceeds from the tiny creature were earmarked for charity. Specifically, the Red Cross, to help with Ebola relief efforts in West Africa. Whether it's that a lot of gamers like goats, or that a lot of gamers hate Ebola, Blizzard is happy to report that Argy sales raised more than $1.9 million, which has now been officially handed to the Red Cross. For more information on any of these stories, or to keep up to date with the latest gaming news, head to playerattack.com. But for now, stick around, we've got plenty more still to come. G'day guys, I'm Jackson, I'll science Jay-Z, I'm from Player Attack and I'm with cricketing legend Brett Lee. Um, before we get started, I just want to say congratulations on an awesome career. Uh, pity about that last ball, but uh, in the year 2020 there, but what did you think of that? Well see, maybe if I was playing the game console, I would have um, chose maybe a slower ball or a bouncer to get it through. But look, in all, in all seriousness, it's it's been a great journey, it's been a lot of fun. I don't think it would have been fair though to finish on a hat-trick, it just... You can't write the script that well, so... I think I think for you that's probably appropriate. I think that's probably one of the most appropriate ways to end. Well, I said to my older brother that regardless of what happens, the last ball of my career, I want to leave nothing in the tank. I want to rip the hammy off the bone. I've had one muscle tear in 22 years, and I actually tweaked my hammy on the last ball, so... Beautiful. So, you're recovering now, but in that case, you can be playing a lot of what we got here, the ICC Pro Cricket 2015. Tell us a little bit about that. Have you been playing the game... Yeah, I've been playing for quite some time now. Um, obviously, it, it, it comes out in about a week, so perfect timing for the World Cup. ICC do it well, Disney do it well, and the graphics, as you probably saw up here today when we were doing the live um, game, it, it's the graphics are fantastic. You can be your own player, you can be a current player of any side around the world. There's uh, 13 or 14 different teams to choose from, and it's a lot of fun. And for the people that can't be out there playing this wonderful game of cricket, can be at home on their PC or their little smartphone. They can be in a club lounge anywhere in any airport, be on the aeroplane. They can be playing it whenever suits. So it's it's a lot of fun. India needs six runs from one ball. And so Sid, just give us the spiel. Sure. So, uh, you know, it's, it's really exciting to be here on the eve of the World Cup, launching the official cricket game of the World Cup. Uh, it's great that we've been able to tie up with ICC, so the players represented in the game are the actual, you know, 14 teams playing the World Cup. Awesome. The, look, I, I was actually talking just before to, to Harsha Bogle and I said, do you remember the game back from like the 2001? They had players like Rocky Punting and, and stuff like that. Uh, it's always good to have the licensed uh, names in there. So that's an awesome part about uh, ICC Pro Cricket. But yeah. Carry on. So, uh, you know, that, that of course is great that we got the ICC on board. The other part is really launching on the eve of the World Cup. And, you know, it's a game that will be available on smartphones as well as uh, as well as a PC platform. And, you know, we've tried to keep the game as authentic as possible, made it really immersive, really realistic. Uh, 25 different camera angles, uh, you know, uh, a certain uh, balance between the amount of control that you have and the chancy element of cricket yeah. to really bring the sport into people's, you know, hearts in, in a way which they love to watch on television. Sure, sure. I mean, I, I got to play a little bit before on the smartphone. I was struggling, to be honest, early on. But uh, it's really intuitive. Like, you really get the feel 
of the game after probably probably an over or two, yep. you really start to get that feel for it. Um, just speak a little bit about, I guess, the the mechanics, the actual gameplay mechanics, and and how people bowl, people bat, what what the kind of mechanics behind that are. So you get a chance to pick your team, and you've got a set of players, and then you choose whether you want to bat or bowl. And if you choose to bat, then you pick, you know, the two uh, the the two batsmen you want to go out with to start with. Mm -hmm. And once you're batting, you can actually pick where you want, where where the sort of shot that you want to be able to take based on how the ball's pitching. Okay. You'll get a sense of how the ball's pitching just before you need to take that decision. Yeah. So it really is like how it is in a game of cricket. Yeah. And, uh, you know, based on your sense of how that bowler is going to play is how is is how you do your shot it's the same with the batsman i mean you 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 get a sense of uh, I, I mean the same with the bowler you have a sense of how the batsman's going to play the sort of you know whether he's going to move to the side whether he's going to play on the off play on the on yeah. and you pitch the ball accordingly so it really is quite intuitive in the sense that we've tried to reflect as closely as possible the decisions that you have to make as a batter and a bowler and that's that's what we've put into the game every past cricketing experience will be forgotten is the SCG in there? Have you been able to play on the SCG or is it MCG? Adelaide Oval in there? I'm from Adelaide, so it'd be nice to see that in there and be able to play on there. Yeah, you have options and it's nice. There's there's sponsors in there as well. You've got Reliance, I saw in there, and you've got different um, ground signage as well. So it's been so professionally done. And that's that's the thing, like, I think back when I was my son's age, eight, playing the Atari, playing those little um, computer graphic games where it's like a stick figure running in, doing high jump. You had like the little control, you using the 20 cent piece to get quicker. The, the world's evolved, tech's evolved, the whole, um, you know, digital space has, has, has evolved and that, it's great. You know, obviously they have also said too from Disney that they want to make sure that kids are out there still being active, as they will be. But this is a great chance also for the kids to learn the, the values of the game, the rules of the game. And to be competitive in a you know like a home environment. Yeah, it gives you that like uh, opportunity to uh, have I guess an insight into what goes on in a cricketing match. Even if you can't get out there, you've got you know all the, the uh, ability to bowl and bat, of course, and it gives you every opportunity to play as the stars of today. And as uh, Harsha Bogle was saying before, like to be a star yourself. Well, that's it. And I said that the next one that they make, they should be um, what I call not sledging but gamesmanship. Should be for you know a few words spoken, not going over that line, of course. Maybe ask the the, the umpire question: Why wasn't that out? How come you no ball me? All the stuff that happens in the, you know, the real world. But um, I think that uh, Mr. Warner would have a quite a high rating on the uh, gamesmanship there, yeah, as well. Or? Well, uh, un unfortunately for Davey Warner, I he sort of got out for a duck this morning when I was playing. But um, you know, he, he hit a few sixes yesterday. But look, great game, great uh, insight to what cricket's about. Fantastic graphics. Disney, it's pretty hard to go wrong with that. Absolutely, I completely agree. Brett, thank you for your time. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Awesome. Last year, we introduced you to this dynamic duo, the Mini Drones from Parrot. That's the company that brought you the AR drone, a nifty quadcopter with a camera that you could control with your smartphone. The newest gadgets, the Jumping Sumo and the Rolling Spider, take that idea to new heights quite literally. Both use the same iOS and Android app as the AR drone, but they're quite different to their bigger brother. <laughs> start with the Rolling Spider, which is an ultra-compact quadcopter with a twist. These oversized wheels are detachable, but they're also very useful for the copter. They help to protect the tiny blades if you accidentally fly it into obstacles, which, let's face it, you probably will, but they're also what gives the Rolling Spider its name. By powering up the rotors not quite enough to fly, you'll be able to roll across the floor and up the wall and across the ceiling with enough practice. The pros make it look easy, but it took us a few times to get just the right amount of lift to get it to stay up there. Flying into stuff, on the other hand, was a piece of cake. Now, 
If you want a drone, something to take aerial photographs or videos, or even something to fly outside, the rolling spider is probably not the best one for you. Its teeny tiny size means that it gets buffeted by even the slightest winds, and while it does have an onboard camera, it's actually used as part of the sensor system and can only take very low res still images of whatever's directly underneath it. But that tiny size is part of what makes this quadcopter so great. It's perfect for indoor flying, and the low power Bluetooth smartphone controls mean that it can pull off some pretty acrobatic tricks. You can control these yourself, or simply hit a button or two to perform barrel rolls and loop de loops. You better be quick though. Another sacrifice for size is that the battery life is pretty minimal. You will get 8 minutes of flying time after 90 minutes of charging, but you can swap out the batteries without too much drama. The reason for this, and for the hefty price tag, is because this tiny rolling spider contains an ARM chip running a full Linux system, something that sets it apart in the world of quadcopters. Yes, there are cheaper toys on the market, but if you want something with an extra geeky factor, this one takes the cake. The second drone is my favourite, the Jumping Sumo. While the rolling spider looks fragile and delicate, which it's really not, the Jumping Sumo is a squat little robot full of attitude. Again, this isn't really a drone as such, it's more of an over-engineered remote control car, but don't take that as a complaint. The Jumping Sumo does have the same wide-angle camera we've seen before in the AR drone, and it's controlled by Wi-Fi, so you can take still images using the app, or use your smartphone or tablet to get a sumo eye view, all within a range of up to 50 metres. The Jumping Sumo can roll around at 7 kilometres an hour, that's 4.5 miles per hour, and this toy is definitely one that you can take outside. But again, that's not why it's called the Jumping Sumo. Parrot has packed a very impressive spring-loaded system into the device that means it can leap 80 centimetres into the air, or 80 centimetres across the ground at just the touch of a button. Happily, these jumps and a bunch of other tricks and show-off moves are programmed into the Free Flight 3 app, so you can do all sorts of fancy things with just a few taps of a touchscreen. The Jumping Sumo also takes 90 minutes to charge, unsurprising as both mini drones use the same battery, but you'll get up to 20 minutes of play with this one. We had a lot of fun with both of the mini drones, but we did have one major complaint. Straight out of the box, we had to update the firmware on both of them, something that we're used to with consoles, but didn't expect for a couple of robots. Worse still, we didn't expect console-style waiting times. The Sumo took an hour to grab and install the update, which took a chunk out of the time we'd hoped to spend playing. That said, we've only had to do it once, and both drones have been trouble-free since. It's just something to be aware of when you start out, or whenever Parrot releases any more major updates. It's also worth noting that the control system takes a little getting used to, combining touchscreen joysticks, action buttons and accelerometers, but both devices are rugged enough that they can withstand being run into a wall or two while you're learning. And that's part of the fun of it all, right? <laughs> When I say narrative adventure game, what's the first company that pops into your head? If it was LucasArts, high five. Feel free to cash it in if we ever meet, but I'm going to guess it was Telltale Games, and why the hell not? With the release of The Walking Dead in 2012, Telltale revolutionised what most people consider a game to be, focusing more on narrative, characters and player choices, which more often than not ended in me having an existential crisis. Telltale essentially has this niche locked down, but there's a new kid on the block looking for a piece of that narrative pie. Life is Strange by French developer Don't Nod. 
Unlike The Walking Dead, Life is Strange makes a bold choice and shifts away from the fantastical, choosing to focus more on the mundane and awkward aspects of teenage life. Whoa, whoa, wait up. Before you zone out, it also has time travel. Yeah, awkward teens and time manipulation. Whatever could go wrong. So what do you want? You don't know who the fuck I am. What are you doing? Get that gun away from me, psycho! No! We slip into the vintage high tops of Max Caulfield, a gifted photography student who's moved back from the big city to a sleepy little hometown to attend a prestigious school. She's appropriately awkward, revels in obscure pop culture, only uses analog technology, and listens to bands you've probably never heard of. Ah, teenagers. Everything's playing out like a perfect indie flick when literally, bam, shit gets real. After witnessing a girl being shot, Max discovers she can somehow reverse time, subsequently using this newfound power to alter events and save the girl's life. All right, so the next logical step is to become a superhero, right? Start stopping world-threatening events and junk. Nope. She freaks out and tries to go about her day as if nothing ever happened. Kinda like a real person. So if you're not becoming a hero, what are you doing? Pretty much living the life of an insecure and self-conscious teen, and I'm not gonna lie, it's pretty great. You navigate Max through the trials and tribulations of daily high school life, dealing with cliques, avoiding drama, clambering for acceptance, they're all par for the course here. The interactions you experience feel genuine, with each of Max's supporting cast feeling like they too have depth and equally valid motives, resulting in you seriously mulling over your choices and their unforeseen consequences. All right, gameplay. I forgot I wasn't reviewing a film. Yeah, there's not a whole lot here, other than moving around and interacting with objects, but don't confuse that for a bad thing. This simple gameplay only makes absorbing and affecting the narrative more streamlined. Hey! Max? Chloe? Oh! Yay, Max! In the bathroom today, you set off the alarm. Destiny. You hella saved my life. Don't ever touch me again! All right, let's talk time travel. It's more butterfly effect than it is back to the future, allowing you to reverse time to change conversation outcomes or events, mostly to your advantage. Other than being used for simple puzzles and pushing you further towards that closet sociopath you've always feared, the mechanics work more like a do-over button, allowing you to experiment with different choices and removing that little bit of anxiety that comes associated with them. Max, what's going on? Where am I? There's something else I have to tell you. Holy shit. Talk to me, Max. No! After one episode, Life is Strange has me hooked. It has fantastically developed characters, wonderful pacing, and it feels like it's coming from a genuine place. Although the core mechanic revolves around the supernatural, it's the game's focus on everyday issues like acceptance and belonging, and even going as far as to tastefully tackle taboo like teen pregnancy and abuse, which keeps it grounded and relatable. It's as if a well-adjusted David Lynch, Stephen King, and Diablo Cody teamed up to remake Saved by the Bell, only with less screech and more time travel. 10 out of 10? would ironically Polaroid Wayward trash again. Oh, and for those writing this off as a simple telltale ripoff, Max Caulfield thinks you're a phony. So, what would you do now? And that's about it for this edition of Player Attack. Thanks for watching. Next week, we have something very exciting, a chat with Lindsay Sterling from her recent tour of Australia. As well as that, we get a little bit nostalgic with a look at The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask, which is out now for 3DS, and try something different as we check out adventure platformer Grow Home from Ubisoft. In the meantime, you can catch us on playerattack.com. We are on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. And if you've got something you want to say, send us an email, mailbox at playerattack.com, or just hop on our forums. Till next week, I'm Jessica Citizen, and this is Player Attack.